Hello and welcome from Buenos Aires, Argentina, to this episode of Crossing Borders with Nathan Lustig, where Nate has conversations with entrepreneurs doing business across borders and the people who support them, with a focus on those that have some connection to Latin America. My name is Josefina Dominguez, and I am an editor for Latin List, a proud sponsor of the Crossing Borders podcast. Sign up for our weekly updates on latinlist.com to get a summary of the week's biggest headlines in Latin American tech news. Nate's guest today is Christine Kenna, a partner at Ignia Partners, which is a VC firm based in Mexico that invests in companies that are serving the emerging middle class of Latin America. They talk about how a consulting gig in Mexico turned into a whole career in Latin America for Christine, how her perspective on venture capital completely changed when she joined Ignia, and they also reflect on how Latin America's ecosystem has changed over the past 10 years. Christine also sheds some light on how being a woman entrepreneur can sometimes be advantageous in Latin America's venture capital industry. We hope you enjoy this conversation with Christine Kenna. Hey, Christine, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for being willing to do it. Thank you, Nathan. Where are you in the world today? I am in Mexico City at my home, working from home, as we all are. And tell me a little bit about what you do at Ignea. What do you do on your day-to-day -day basis? So at Ignea, I get to spend a lot of time talking with entrepreneurs. Uh, I'm a partner where I focus on two things. One is meeting future uh, portfolio companies or great entrepreneurs in the ecosystem that we're thinking about investing in, uh, learning about their own stories, learning about their opportunities, the companies they're building. And then the majority of my time, especially these last few months, is spent on working with our portfolio companies. And I think that's where I derive the greatest amount of satisfaction, where we have the greatest challenges, is uh, helping these companies uh, you know, go through their bottlenecks and really grow and sort of whatever that company needs at that time. And I think the majority of my, my focus is working with that entrepreneur, with that founder and that CEO, sort of to be a sounding board to him or her and, uh, and you know, help that entrepreneur grow as much as possible uh, throughout our journey. Uh, and then alongside and sort of throughout all of this, I spend a lot of time working with the Ignea team. Uh, you know, this is not something that we do individually. I have a wonderful group of partners and, uh, and associates, and the Ignea team also requires, um, you know, a lot of time together to just be smarter and better investors. What kind of companies does Ignea invest in? What kind of stage? What kind of amounts? Sure. So Ignea is a VC fund where we are based in Mexico, yet we are looking to invest in companies that are either expanding into Latin America. So we've invested in companies based in Silicon Valley and Israel and New York, and they are attacking or entering the Latin American market, particularly Mexico, or companies that are based in Latin America, so you know, Argentina or Colombia and Mexico, and growing uh, within the region or internationally as well. We typically look for companies in Series A. I would say that is our sweet spot. We're happy to lead deals. So we always co-invest. I think that's something very important to do uh, to leverage the benefit of different uh, minds and more capital at the table. Uh, but uh, we will also invest in, I guess, what you call seed rounds, but tickets uh, from $500,000. Uh, we'd like to come in around one to $3 million, and we'll go up to 10. An uh, important part of our investment strategy is to save uh, half of our capital for follow-ons. And so we're able to accompany the best companies along their journey as they grow. So yeah, we focused on companies that are serving the emerging middle class. That typically looks like B2C companies or B2B2C, so focusing on the SME market. And we're looking at companies that are, you know, everything is technology enabled, but that are creating new industries, right? That, um, that are really uh, scaling rapidly and serving a purpose to solve an enormous problem with their end users. Where are you from originally? So I'm originally from Palo Alto. So I kind of, I grew up in the, the heart of Silicon Valley and I didn't come to Mexico until uh, my early twenties, really. And sort of a fluke, 
uh, I was on a consulting uh, gig here in Mexico City for a few months that led into a year and then later a whole career in Latin America. So I've been uh, working, investing in Mexico since 2006. Did you always know that you wanted to be an investor and in tech or was it something that came up during your consulting career? No, I actually was pretty adamant about not ever wanting to be a venture capitalist when I was growing up. <laughs> uh, to me, it was it, it came across as just an industry that was uh, all about making money and very cutthroat, um, very uh, white male focused. And I was highly turned off by that. Uh, I was very intrigued, though, by the growth and, and all of the innovation that was happening uh, in Silicon Valley. And I loved that. So I would say the first part of my career was, was focused in operations. I had a phenomenal time working at Google and just being witness to how that company was growing and scaling. It was, I started the summer where they did their IPO and, and then I jumped over to Europe and was working in their Paris office when they were just opening and it was just explosive growth and they were changing lives and organizing the world's information. And I loved that part of the, uh, of the ecosystem. And I thought I would be on the operating side of, of high growth startups for the rest of my career until I met Ignea. And when I first discovered that Ignea existed, I was interested in going to ask for capital. So I was actually looking to start my own company when I met one of Ignea's LPs, a mentor of mine from Harvard Business School, who was an investor in Ignea because she worked alongside Ignea's co-founder, Michael Chu. And Michael Chu is a professor at Harvard, but was also uh, known, and, and I had met him at Harvard because of his course, the Business at the Base of the Pyramid, where the focus was about how to grow businesses uh, with the emerging middle class and highly focused in Latin America. So when I met Alvaro and Michael through this LP, I just couldn't believe that Ignea existed. It was so incredibly exciting to sort of be at the cusp at the very beginning of uh, what is now the venture ecosystem in Latin America. And Ignea was really the pioneer in the sector. It was the first VC fund in Mexico, you know, the largest at the time. Uh, we had some incredible LPs that were helping us uh, get off the ground from the Omidyar network um, to large development banks. And uh, I was interested in joining the venture side, but more as an operating partner, more as helping these startups grow and scale, which was where my experience was. And then after doing it for a few years, I just got entirely hooked. And now I think there is nothing more phenomenal to do in the world than to uh, be on the investing side where we can have such an impact at such a greater scale. So instead of just focusing on one company, we now have a portfolio of 27 companies in our second fund where I can work with all of these phenomenal entrepreneurs and, and help them uh, indirectly as much as I can from, from the board and more as a, a coach advisor to these entrepreneurs um, than, than actually running the businesses myself. A lot of the listeners on the podcast maybe are new to LATAM over the last couple of years, or there maybe were entrepreneurs that got started in you know, 2015, 2016. And so much has changed from even 2014 when I was uh, getting started in investing, yeah. but you've been involved even longer. Talk a little bit about how things have changed since you first started investing with Ignea to today. Wow. Well, I would say that the entire ecosystem has changed dramatically. Um, but what has not changed is the opportunity. And what is so intriguing to you know, what, we're, what we're looking at today and, and was then is just the enormous, uh, the, the blue ocean markets, their extreme pain points, highly underserved populations uh, that through technology, so many of their problems can be solved, right? So uh, capital markets are just beginning to enter Latin America. And I think we're just beginning to see some of the international investors feel comfortable coming into the region. And so as an investor willing to 
you know, roll up her sleeves and do the work and be on the ground and work with the entrepreneurs, I think we're seeing an unprecedented amount of opportunities. So how have things changed? Is that when Igni was founded, uh, it was when the iPhone was just coming out, for example, um, to give you an idea of what technology was like then. Um, there were no other funds with which we could co-invest. And so we had great challenges in terms of getting follow-on rounds for the companies that we were supporting. And also the, the types of businesses that we're looking at were very different. You know, today the infrastructure is in place in Latin America. You know, we have 70% penetration of internet. You know, you have, you know, one of the largest global markets for internet users. Um, the fact that all of these international digital players today uh, are aware of the value of Latin America. You have Spotify with Mexico as their number one market. You know, have Uber as Mexico is the third largest market for them. Diddy, it's the largest market outside of China. Uh, everything for us, Facebook, uh, Netflix, WhatsApp, LinkedIn, they all know the value of Latin America and the Latin American consumer. Uh, and so now the startups have an opportunity to bring their technologies and grow here. Uh, so I think we've seen an evolution also of the type of entrepreneur, sort of the, the, sav the business savvy, the experience, and, and certainly the ambition of the entrepreneurs in Latin America. You know, I think uh, the, the question that I always get as an investor in the region is they always ask, you know, what is more scarce, the amount of opportunities you have to invest in uh, or the amount of capital that is the region? And I think 100% we have a scarcity of capital in the region. Uh, but it's capital that is willing to be on the ground and willing to invest a in a smart way and help the entrepreneurs grow. Because I will say the Latin American entrepreneur is not as polished as the Silicon Valley entrepreneur. You know, they're not, I would say they're not as slick. They're not as, you know, they don't have the VC lingo uh, quite down as well yet. And so the venture capitals that are maybe willing to look through that rusty veneer and uh, they can find those really incredible entrepreneurs that have much more grit, uh, much more conviction. Because I think the Latin American entrepreneurs that we meet are very close to their customers. You know, they're very close to the problem. You know, it's not that they've come up with this idea just sort of ruminating about something great they would like to build or, or you know, uh, sitting at a, at a desk in, in a business school. Entrepreneurs we meet, are really uh, have no choice except to launch these companies to solve this problem that they've been living very personally for years. Uh, so in that sense, uh, a lot of great qualities for, for, these, for these entrepreneurs. Yeah, I think you're, you're spot on with the kind of diamond in the rough analogy there of yeah. how good the Latin American entrepreneurs are, but don't know just cultural differences between right. uh, how do you pitch a LATAM uh, company versus how do you pitch to a U.S. investor? They're they're completely different things. Um, they're a whole new learning, uh, a whole new set of lessons you have to learn when you're going to raise capital in the U.S. And part of our job as investors is being able to invest early and then be able to help them kind of raise that money from abroad once they and teach them the the kind of pieces that need to be taught. That's right. That's right. And you know, a lot of entrepreneurs. Uh, I would say you mentioned the cultural element of it. Uh, you are more successful at raising capital if you can show more confidence in your story and your narrative. And if you come in fully believing what's going to happen and you know how you can get it, you might not be there yet, but that sort of level of conviction for your future, I think that goes against the grain of many of the Latin American cultures that perhaps are more conservative or the entrepreneurs are more ready to share with you their obstacles or their doubts along the way. And uh, you know, it's, it's uh, not necessarily the style of what we see in, in uh, sort of the American uh, raised Silicon Valley training for these pitches. What advice would you give to entrepreneurs when they're thinking about raising money in LATAM and then also when they go abroad to raise money? Well, I think it all starts with authenticity first. So the advice that I give all of the entrepreneurs is that they first have to really own their story and their narrative about their company. They have to have conviction. And then how you tell that story 
is extremely important. Right? Because at the end of the day, we invest in people. That is by far the most important element of every investment. We all know this. But I would advise the entrepreneurs that the faster they can get to telling why they are so convinced about this company that they're building and why this is the only entrepreneur that can build this company, the more I'm going to fall in love with them and their business, right? So I think being able to tell that story and tell that quickly is extremely important, right? So of course, when we evaluate a company, we're gonna look at all of the important factors, the market size, you know, what is the business plan? What is the technology, you know, the opportunity? All of, all of those things are gonna, are gonna play a factor. But what really makes a difference so that that entrepreneur can be part of the 2% of companies that we actually do invest in. And that is the ability to build that connection and that trust and that conviction with the entrepreneur uh, over time. Because again, this is not uh, you know, a short-term relationship. At the end of the day, when an investor comes into your company, you're inviting them to, you know, the entrepreneur invites investor to his or her party. You know, it's his or her dream and vision. And it's like a marriage. And you really have to believe in that person, that person's values, and have an enormous amount of trust in that person's uh, potential and potential to grow. Uh, I see some of the greatest mistakes when we meet with entrepreneurs is that they don't listen. You know, one of the things that we're always looking for is who is this person? You know, are they able to take advice? Is this entrepreneur self-aware and able to learn quickly? Uh, is this someone who is going to be able to evolve with the market, with the company? Because, you know, we've seen countless number of great businesses uh, do pivots along the way. We know that will happen, but that entrepreneur has to be able to adjust along with those pivots and with the growth of that company and the growth of the team. So that's, that's a place I would start. You were the co-founder of Women in Private Equity and VC in Mexico. Uh, talk a little bit about what it's like being a woman, a woman in VC in tech in LATAM and some of the things you're doing to help um, make the path easier for other women who maybe want to get involved in, in investing. Well, from my personal experience, I would say being a woman in Latin America and a woman in venture capital and tech is an enormous advantage because there are just so few women. Whenever I walk into a room or whenever we're the only woman in a board seat, and which is most of the time, people will listen. I also think that as a woman, I can provide an enormous amount of value just in diversity of perspective and opinion. And as we know, and as all the data says, the more diverse opinions that are brought into a decision create better decisions, better returns. And so I think that I have had a great advantage in this sector. I also think I have a great advantage because there are very few female investors in the region. So we get to talk with all the best female entrepreneurs as well. And I think we can help those female entrepreneurs in a, in a unique way. And we will see things differently than, for example, some of my male partners. Now, I will also say that it is not an easy path, especially for, I would say, the, uh, the Mexican women, Latin American women growing up in this region. Because I come from an American culture, I come from an American education, where I have always uh, felt encouraged to speak my voice, and I'm very direct, and I think uh, you know, the only thing that we can do in our careers is be as prepared as possible and work as hard as possible. You know, we never know the opportunities that are gonna come up in front of us. We just have to be willing to take those opportunities when they come and, and hope that our preparation is enough to get us in the door. And I think uh, in the cultures of Latin America, and particularly Mexico, those opportunities typically do not put women front and center. And so one of my greatest revelations when I first came to Mexico was the lack of networks for professional women. And so my lifeline and the way I was able to continue to uh, grow and develop in Mexico was to build that network. So one of the first things I did along with some dear friends of mine and Harvard Business School classmates was create an organization called MBA Mujeres de Mexico. Where we got together simply to build our own networks and to help each other out professionally, to recruit each other. 
to help us with our trainings and be a support network in this society. And then when I joined venture capital, I realized that there was an even bigger void or lack of women in this industry. So again, the few women that I knew in this region, we band together to start really just for beginning were dinners, conversations about how we could help each other out. And we immediately found enormous connections that evolved into uh, uh, officially being part of a mixed cap. You know, I was the first female board member of a mixed cap in Mexico, which is the equivalent, I guess, of the NVCA uh, for Mexico. And then within the board, we created a committee for inclus inclusion and diversity. And I think this was a really important step because suddenly we had the platform of all of the funds throughout asset class and private equity in venture capital and in infrastructure and real estate committed to supporting women in the industry. At the same time, as the MX Cap Committee uh, became more formal, we launched a group called Mujeres Invertiendo. And Mujeres Invertiendo is a network of now over 150 women who are active investment professionals, who are all committed, again, to help support each other and grow our careers, where we have not only uh, you know, training sessions once a month, but networking sessions, but we also help to support each other by sharing deals and by you know, trying to connect great entrepreneurs with other investors. And I think all of that is, is so important. Um, I think women in Latin America fundamentally interact in a different way and they feel more comfortable in certain settings to ask those questions that they might feel silly not to know, right? And so uh, I think some of the mentorships also are a little bit more natural within these women's organizations. So we continue to, uh, you know, grow as an organization and I'm very excited as we continue to work with other groups across Latin America and expand our network of not only investors, but also female entrepreneurs. If you could go back to when you first started investing, knowing everything you know today, what advice would you give yourself? I think the hardest advice to actually take is a fact that in this industry, we have to be very comfortable with the risk of making mistakes. We have very long feedback loops in venture capital. We won't know if we were good investors or not until years down the road. And so my advice would be to enter in my investments with conviction from the beginning and to be a lot less afraid of failure. You know, it took me having to close down a company entirely and be the one to tell the employees, you know, that this was happening and then go tell my investors that we had lost their, their capital that they invested, even though this was part of the business model of venture capital fund. But it took me living it personally to really internalize the seriousness of what we do, which helped me internalize the seriousness of each new investment decision I make. And you know, I know that there is risk when I go into the investment, but it makes me even be more cautious and savvy and thoughtful about that decision. You know, I think a lot of people uh, imagine that being a venture capitalist is a very glamorous job. Uh, it is it's entirely not glamorous. It is an extremely difficult job. And where I also advise people who want to get into the VC, I would say that first, they should get real operating experience. They should have scar tissue. They should have failures. They should have successes. But at the end of the day, I am only as good as the investments that I make, and those are entirely dependent on the entrepreneurs. The entrepreneurs are the real heroes in, in this world and in this business. And my 100% focus is how to help that entrepreneur grow. I certainly could not be good in this job if I had also not had experience on my own before being an investor. So I, I think the second piece of advice is also to go out and, and make some mistakes. You know, do things that really scare you. And I think at the end of the, my decisions that I've made, some of the craziest decisions I've made in my career have always been the decisions that I've been most scared about. You know, things like moving to Mexico, uh, you know, things like jumping into entirely different careers. And the more comfortable we get with that uncertainty that is inherent in our business, I think the better investors will be. I think that's really, really good advice. And it's a great place to stop on this version. We're going to have to do a round two another time uh, to go even deeper. There's lots and lots of stuff we could keep talking about. But 
thank you very much for taking the time to uh, share your story. Really appreciate it. Great. Thank you, Nathan. Thanks again for listening to this episode of Crossing Borders with our guest, Christine Kenna. And thank you to Angel Andreca for producing this podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, please share with a friend and give us a rating on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. It's the best way to share what's going on in Latin America's ecosystem. 